Well, I thought there'd be a podium, so I'm <laughs> a bit scared. Uh, <laughs> Chris asked me to tell again how we found the structure of DNA. And since, you know, I follow his orders, I'll do it. But it slightly bores me. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote a book. So I'll say something. Uh, <laughs> I'll say a little about, uh, you know, how the discovery was made and why Francis and I found it. And then I hope maybe I have uh, at least five minutes to say what uh, uh, makes me tick now. Uh, back of me is a picture of me when I was... Uh, 17, I was at the University of Chicago in my third year, and uh, I was in my third year because the University of Chicago let you in after two years of high school, so you, uh, it, was, it was fun to get away from high school. And, because uh, I'm very small, and I was no good in sports or anything like that, but I should say that uh, uh, my background, my uh, father was, you know, raised to be an Episcopalian and Republican, but uh, after one year of college, he became an atheist and a Democrat. <laughs> and uh, uh, my mother was Irish Catholic, and but she didn't take ser uh, you know, religion too seriously, and by the age of 11, I was no longer going to Sunday Mass and going on birdwatching uh, walks with my father. So uh, early on, I heard of Charles Darwin. Uh, I guess, you know, he was the, the big hero. And, you know, uh, you understand life as it now exists uh, through evolution. And uh, at the University of Chicago, I was a zoology major and thought I would end up, uh, you know, if I was bright enough, maybe getting a PhD from Cornell in ornithology. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, in the Chicago paper, there was a review of a book that, uh, called What is Life by the great physicist Schrodinger. And that, of course, had been a question I wanted to know. You know, Darwin explained life after it got started, but what was the essence of life? And uh, Schrodinger said the essence was information uh, present on our chromosomes, and it had to be present uh, uh, on a molecule. <laughs> I never really thought of molecules before you know, chromosomes, but this was a molecule, and uh, somehow well, the information was probably present in some digital form, and th there was a big question, how did you copy the information? So uh, that was the book, and uh, so from that moment on, I <laughs> wanted to uh, uh, be a geneticist, understand the gene, and through that, understand life. So. Uh, I had, you know, a hero at a distance, wasn't a baseball player, it was Linus Pauling. And uh, so I applied to Caltech and uh, they turned me down. Uh, <laughs> so I went to Indiana, which was actually as good as Caltech in genetics. And uh, besides, they had a really good basketball team. So I had a really quite happy life at Indiana. And it was in Indiana, uh, I got the impression that, you know, the gene was likely to be DNA. And so when I got my PhD, I should go in search of DNA. So I first went to uh, Copenhagen because uh, I thought, well, maybe I could become a biochemist, but I discovered biochemistry was very boring. Uh, it wasn't going anywhere toward, you know, saying what the gene was. It was just nucleosides. And, uh, oh, that's the book, little book. You can read it in about two hours. And, uh, but then I went to a meeting in Italy, and uh, uh, there was an unexpected speaker. He wasn't on the program, and he talked about DNA. This was Morris Wilkins. He was trained as a physicist, and after the war, he wanted to do biophysics, and he picked DNA because DNA had been shown at the Rockefeller Institute to possibly be the genetic molecules on the chromosomes. Most people believed it was proteins. But Wilkins uh, you know, thought DNA was the best bet, and uh, he showed this x-ray photograph. And <laughs> it was sort of crystalline. So DNA had a structure, even though it all oh, probably different molecules carried a different set of instructions. So there was something universal about the DNA molecule. So I wanted to work with him, but he didn't want a former bird watcher. And I ended up in Cambridge, England. So I went to Cambridge because uh, it was really the best place in the world then for X-ray crystallography. And X-ray crystallography is now subject to, you know, chemistry departments. But in those days, it was in the domain of the physicists. 
So uh, the best place for X-ray crystallography was at the Cavendish Laboratory at uh, Cambridge. And uh, there I met Francis Crick. Uh, I went there without knowing him. He was 35, I was 23. And uh, within a day, we uh, decided that uh, maybe we could take a shortcut to finding the structure of DNA, not solve it by, you know, uh, in rigorous fashion, but build a model, a molecular model, using some coordinates, some, you know, length, all that sort of stuff, uh, from X-ray photographs, but just ask what the molecule, how should it fold up? And uh, the reason for doing so is Senator the photograph, Ms. Linus Pauling, about six months before, he proposed the alpha helical structure for proteins. And in doing so, he banished the man on the right, uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg, who was the Cavendish professor. This is a photograph several years later when Bragg had caused a smile. He certainly wasn't smiling when I got there because he was somewhat humiliated by Pauling getting the alpha helix and uh, the Cambridge people failing because they weren't chemists. And uh, certainly neither Crick or I were chemists. So we tried to build a model, and uh, he knew, uh, Francis knew Wilkins. Wilkins said he thought it was a helix, X-ray diagram he thought was compatible with the helix. So we built a three-stranded model. The people from London came up, Wilkins and this uh, collaborator, or possible collaborator, Rosalind Franklin, came up and sort of laughed at our model. They said it was lousy, and uh, it was. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> we were told to build no more models. We were incompetent. And uh, <laughs> so, we didn't build any models, and Francis sort of continued to work on proteins, and <laughs> basically, I did nothing. Uh, and uh, except read. You know, uh, basically, reading is a good thing. You get facts. And uh, we kept telling the people in London that Linus Pauling is going to move on to DNA. If DNA is that important, Linus will know it. He'll build a model and everyone will be scooped. And in fact, he'd written the people in London. Could he see their x-ray photograph? And they had the wisdom to say no. So he didn't have it. But there was ones in the literature. Actually, Linus didn't look at them that carefully. But uh, about... Uh, uh, 15 months after I got to Cambridge, or rumors began to appear from Linus Pauling's son, who was in Cambridge, his father was now working on DNA. And uh, so one day, Peter came in, it says Peter Pauling, and gave me a copy of his father's manuscript. And uh, boy, I was scared, because I thought, you know, we may be scooped. I have nothing to do, no qualifications for anything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there was the paper, and he proposed, uh, a three standard structure, and I read it, and it was just, it was crap. Uh, <laughs> so this was, you know, unexpected uh, from the world. <laughs> and uh, so it was held together by hydrogen bonds between phosphate groups. Well, at the uh, peak pH that cells have, around seven, those Hydrogen bonds couldn't exist. We rushed over to the chemistry department and said, could Pauling be right? And Alex Todd said no, so uh, uh, we were happy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we were still in the game, but we were fr frightened that someone at Caltech would tell Lloyd us that he was wrong. And uh, so Bragg said build models, and uh, a month after we got the Pauling manuscript, uh, I should say, I took the manuscript to London to show the people, you know, that Linus was wrong and they were still in the game. And they should immediately start building models, but uh, Wilkins said no. Uh, Rosalind Franklin was leaving in about two months, and after she left, uh, he would start building models. And uh, so I came back with that news to Cambridge, and Bragg said build models. Or, of course, I wanted to build models. And uh, there was a picture of Rosalind. Uh, she really, you know, in one sense, she was a chemist, but really she would have been trained, uh, she didn't know any organic chemistry or quantum chemistry. She was a crystallographer. And uh, I think part of the reason she didn't want to build models is she wasn't a, a chemist, whereas Pauling was a chemist. And uh, so Crick and I uh, you know, started building models, and I learned a little chemistry, but not enough. Well, we got the answer on 28th of uh, February, 53, and it was because of a rule, which to me is a very good rule, never be the brightest person in the room. And uh, 
We weren't. I mean, we weren't the best chemists in the room. I went in and showed them a pairing I'd done, and then <laughs> Jerry Donahue, he was a chemist. He said, it's wrong. You've got the hydrogen atoms are in the wrong place. I just put them down like they were in the books. He said they were wrong. So the next day, you know, after I thought, well, he might be right, so I changed the locations, and then we found the, the base pairing, and Francis and me, they said the chains run in opposite directions, and uh, we knew we were right. So uh, it was a pretty, you know, it all happened in about two hours. <laughs> you know, from nothing to bing. And we knew it was big because, uh, you know, uh, if you just put A next to T and G next to C, you have a copying mechanism. So we saw how genetic information is carried. It's the order of the four bases. So in a sense, it is a sort of digital type information. And you, you copy it by going from uh, strand separating. So it's, you know, if it didn't work this way, you know, uh, you, know you might as well believe it because you didn't have any other scheme. Uh, <laughs> But that's not the way most scientists think. Most scientists are really uh, rather dull. They say, we won't think about it until we know it's right. But, you know, we thought it was at least 95% right or 99% right, so think about it. Uh, the next five years, there were essentially something like five references to our work in nature. None. And uh, so we were left by ourselves and uh, trying to do the last part of the, the trio. Uh, how do you, uh, how, what does the genetic information do? And it was pretty obvious that it provided the information to an RNA molecule and then how do you go from RNA to protein? Uh, for about three years we just, I tried to solve the structure of RNA, it didn't, uh, Yield didn't give good x-ray photographs. I was largely unhappy. A girl didn't marry me. It was really, you know, sort of a shitty time. Uh, so there's a picture of Francis and I before I met the girl, so I'm still looking happy. Uh, but uh, there is what we did when we didn't know where to go forward. We formed a club. Uh, and called it the RNA tie club. George Gamow, the great uh, physicist, uh, he designed the tie. He was one of the members. And the question was, how do you go from a four-letter code to the 20-letter code of uh, proteins? Uh, uh, Feynman was a member, and uh, Teller, and friends of Gamow. Uh, but uh, that's the only photo. No, we were only photographed twice, and in both occasions, you know, one of us was missing the tie. There's Francis up on the uh, upper right, and uh, Alex Rich, the MD turned crystallographer, is next to me. This was taken in Cambridge in uh, September of 1955. And uh, I'm smiling, I <laughs> sort of forced, I think, because uh, the girl, uh, boy, she is gone. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, I didn't really get happy until 1960, uh, because then we found out basically, you know, that, that there are three forms of RNA, and we knew basically DNA provides the information, or RNA, RNA provides the information, protein, and that led Marshall Nirenberg, you know, to take RNA, synthetic RNA, put it in a system making protein, and made uh, poly, uh, uh, Phenylalanine, polyumine phenylalanine. So uh, that the first, uh, first cracking of the genetic code, and it was all over by 1966. So that, that's what Chris wanted me to do. It was, uh, uh, so what happened since then? Well, at that time, uh, I should go back. When we found the structure of DNA, uh, uh, I, in my first talk at Cold Spring Harbor, the physicist Leo Zlard, uh, he looked at me and said, are you going to patent this? And, but uh, he, he knew patent law and knew we couldn't patent it because there was no use for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so DNA didn't become a useful molecule and the lawyers didn't enter into the equation until uh, 1973, 20 years later, when Boyer and Cohen at, uh, in San Francisco and Stanford came up with their method of recombinant DNA and Stanford patented and made a lot of money. That is, they patented something which, you know, could you do useful things and uh, then they learned how to read the letters of the code and boom, we've... Uh, you know, head of biotech industry, and uh, uh, 
but we're still a long ways from, you know, asking, answering a question which sort of dominated my childhood, which is uh, how do you uh, nature nurture? And uh, so I'll go on. I'm already out of time, but this is Michael Wigler, a very, very clever mathematician turned physicist, and he developed a technique which uh, essentially will let us look at sample DNA at eventually a million spots along it. There's a chip there, a conventional one, then there's one made by a photolithography by a company in Madison called Nimblechen, which is uh, uh, way ahead of Affymetrics, and uh, we use their technique. And what you can do is sort of compare DNA of normal, say, versus cancer, and uh, you can see on the top that cancers which are bad show insertions or deletions. So the DNA is really badly mucked up, whereas if you have a chance of surviving, the DNA isn't so mucked up. So we think that this will eventually lead to what we call DNA biopsies. Before you get treated for cancer, you should really look at this technique and get a feeling of the face of the enemy. It's not a, it's only a partial look, but it's a, I think it's going to be very, very useful. So we started with breast cancer because there's lots of money for it, uh, no government money. And uh, now I have a sort of vested interest. I want to do it for prostate cancer. So, you know, you aren't treated if, you know, it's not dangerous. And uh, so, but Winkler, besides, you know, looking at cancer cells, looked at normal cells and made a really sort of surprising observation, which is all of us have about 10 places in our genome where we've lost a gene or gained another one. So we're, we're sort of all imperfect. And the question is, well, if we're around here, you know, these losses or gains might not be too bad. But if these deletions or amplifications occurred in the wrong gene, maybe you really are sick. So the first disease he looked at was autism. And uh, the reason that we looked at autism is we had the money to do it. To look at an individual is about $3,000, and the parent of a child with Asperger's disease, the high intelligence autism, had sent his thing to a conventional company. They didn't do it, couldn't do it by conventional genetics, but just scanning it, uh, we began to find genes for autism. And you can see here, uh, there are a lot of them. So, a lot of autistic kids are autistic because they just lost a big piece of DNA. I mean, big piece at the molecular level. We saw one autistic kid, uh, five million bases just missing from one of his chromosomes. We haven't yet looked at the parents, but the parents probably don't have that loss or they wouldn't be parents. Now, uh, so our autism study is just beginning. We got $3 million. I think it'll cost at least 10 to 20 before you'd be in a position to help parents who've had an autistic child or think they may have an autistic child and can we uh, spot the difference. So this same technique should probably look at all. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful way to find genes. And so I'll conclude by saying we've looked at 20 people with schizophrenia. And we thought we probably had to look at several hundred before we got a picture. But as you can see there, 7 out of 20 had a change which was very high. And in the controls, there were three. So what's the meaning of the controls? Were they crazy also and we didn't know it? Or, you know, were they normal? Uh, I, I would guess they're normal. And uh, what we think in schizophrenia is their genes that predispose you. And, uh, whether this is one that predisposes, and then there's only a subsegment of the population that's capable of being schizophrenic. Now, we don't have really any evidence of it, but I see, to give a hypothesis, the best guess is that if you're left handed, you're prone to schizophrenia. 30% uh, of schizophrenic people are left-handed, and schizophrenia has a very funny genetics, which means 60% of the people are genetically left-handed, but only half of it showed. I don't have the time to say it. Now, some people who think they're right-handed are genetically left-handed. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying that if you think, oh, I don't carry a left-handed gene, <laughs> so therefore my you know, children won't be at risk of schizophrenia, you might. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's, to me, an extraordinary, exciting time. 
we ought to be able to find the gene for bipolar, there's a relationship, and if I had enough money, we'd find them all this year. I thank you.